Okay, morning girls. Um, about 30% of all open essay questions involves some kind of evaluation of Augustus's rule, whether he's a successful leader or a destroyer of the Republic. If we expand that to questions which include the success of dealing with the Senate, and we also look at questions that involve just a general evaluation of him as a leader, I would say almost half of the time a question like this comes up. So evaluating um, his, his rule, I would say, is probably the most important aspect of the course, and that should be reflected in your revision program, okay? You could rely quite heavily on the sources, because you've got Suetonius and you've got uh, Tacitus, and they contrast with each other quite well. Also, in terms of your revision notes, we put, I'm going to cover, and I'll cover this in this screencast, there are quite a few different historians' views on whether Augustus was successful or not. So there's not a wrong or right answer, but it would be a very good idea in your revision program to make your own judgments and to base those judgments on real hard evidence and historians' opinions, etc. So in the screencast, I just want to look at the evaluation of Augustus, cover the need for counter-argument, and to end with the problems of succession. Because if we're going to attack Augustus, it's going to be on this particular ground. So I've sent you an essay, which is, Augustus was a great ruler of Rome. Explain how far you agree with this statement. It's a very generic question. In, if, strictly speaking, I think it's almost unanswerable, because if you were to provide a comprehensive answer of that, would have to go into thousands of words. It would go, you know, to an EPQ kind of idea. So in terms of um, answering the question, uh, first of all, you would have to confine your response to maybe two areas, possibly three. Um, so the first thing I want to emphasize is a warning that this kind of question really does require you to narrow the parameters of the question, and in a moment we'll look at how you can do that. I also want to remind you of something that we see. You always need what we call hedging in your answer. So hedging is a kind of linguistic convention where you acknowledge that there is another way of looking at things. And that usually means using modal verbs like it could be seen as, some people might see it as, and as I say here, these kind of phrases are key. Whilst it should be acknowledged that, then you're going to come out with a different view. It is indisputable that, however, a balanced view requires that. As I say here, in terms of this course, our go-to person is Tacitus for a critique of Augustus. We do not have a lot of information from Tacitus, and bear in mind our source is only book a one chapters one to ten, which is actually quite a short bit, and even that section mainly concerns Tiberius. But Tacitus blames Augustus fair and square for the problems of the Principit, and he's the person who most explicitly and overtly describes him as a monarch, as an authoritarian, and as the destroyer of the Republic. So I would always, if you get any question on Augustus's rule, his relationship with the Senate, etc., always have Tacitus in there. That's why he's on the course, yeah? Now, moving on then, let's have a quick look at what Tacitus says. As Mr. Burke said, we don't need to necessarily quote, but I do think the odd word or phrase that's very memorable would be quite useful, okay? Tacitus says of Augustus, after laying down his triumphal title, here he's talking about the first constitutional settlement, isn't he? Proclaiming himself a simple consul, content with tribunitian authority to safeguard the commons. There he's actually talking about the fact that uh, Augustus's earlier title was the tribunitian authority. Uh, and what Tacitus is suggesting here is that that is actually just a smokescreen for his real power. He first conciliated the army by gratuities. Let's not forget we could cross-reference to Res Gestae there, where uh, Augustus continually boasts about his many grants of money 
He first conciliated uh, the army by gratuities, the populace by cheap and corn. Again, in Resgesti, he boasts about the fact that he's in charge of the corn supply. The world, the amenities of peace. Then, step by step, he began to make his ascent to unite in his own person the functions of the Senate, the Magistry, and the Legislature. I think that would be quite a memorable idea, just to remember that he then combines the Senate, the Magistry, and the Legislature. So Rome's ancient constitution that had some, in theory at least, some separation of the powers, according to Tacitus, is erased. So if you're looking to argue that Augustus is indeed an authoritarian, that he con concentrated power in his own hands, that the Senate lost power, that the Senate became a kind of simulation of a debate chamber, then Tacitus is our go-to person. In the second slide here, again we look at Tacitus, he said, it was thus an altered world, and of the old unspoilt Roman character, not a trace lingered. That would be a nice phrase to learn, wouldn't it? Not a trace of the unspoiled Roman character. Equality was an outworn creed, and all our eyes looked to the mandate of the sovereign. So let's not forget, he's calling him there a sovereign. He's using the language of monarchy, isn't he? So if you get a question saying that effectively Augustus became a monarch, then Tacitus would be your go-to person. If you're going to agree with Tacitus, you'd go into detail and you'd say Tacitus's account is very convincing, etc., for the following reasons. If you're going to argue that Augustus wasn't a monarch, then you'd say uh, Tacitus overstates this. And you'll notice here, one of the things that uh, we look for in a grade A student is that you're able to actually evaluate the sources. Well, really, is it true to say that, that the Republic was about an unspoiled Roman character? It's a romanticization of the Republic, isn't it? Don't forget that Tacitus is writing much later, isn't he? Well after the death of Augustus. So one of the things I would expect you to say is he's looking back with a lot of nostalgia to the Roman Republic. What do we actually know about the Roman Republic? We know the Roman Republic committed suicide, didn't it? It was actually a time of bloodshed, etc. When that decline of the Republic happened is, is not within our course and a very complex question. But what we do know is that by the time of Augustus, the Republic was about civil war and bloodshed. So if you're going to criticize Tacitus, you'd have to say, come on, Tacitus, this is an incredibly rose-tinted view of what the Republic had become and what is lost. Don't forget that Tacitus and Suetonius are writing after Tiberius, Caligula, Nero. So they'd seen the absolute corruption of what the Principate is going to become. So what, how would we answer this question? What kind of positions could we take? We could take the view that Augustus was a, a great leader with some flaws. Okay, that seems a very legitimate uh, position to take. In a moment, I'm going to show you how many great things Augustus did and how we could defend his rule if we so chose. We could argue that Augustus was a great leader, but he had significant flaws probably the position that I would take here. Yeah. Rather than seeing Augustus as a great leader, he should be viewed as a fraud who destroyed the Republic. That's Tacitus' position. It also seems to be the position of Ronald Syme, who we'll see in a moment. Or we could say something like this. After an inauspicious start, Augustus evolved into a great leader. And I think we could actually argue that if you wanted to, and then you could put in the fact that in the early days, even Suetonius acknowledges that uh, Octavian was very uh, ruthless, and there's lots of instances of bloodshed, even in Suetonius's rather rosy account of Augustus. We could even argue, as number five says, even if Augustus's rule could be viewed as successful, his, le his legacy was troublesome. And we'll see that, because the succession is definitely the thorn in his side. We could also argue that Tacitus is guilty of romanticizing the Republic, and it was all dead, all but dead before Augustus came to power. Again, I think many of these statements have truth in them, 
it is up to you to plan a kind of response in which you evaluate all of the achievements of Augustus and you acknowledge them, but you also see that there were defects within the kind of design of the Principate. And in this quick um, screencast, I'm going to be emphasizing in particular the succession and what a flaw that was in terms of the design, okay? Now, as I said when I was talking about um, Tacitus, it's absolutely key at two or three times to try and evaluate the sources. So be aware of the bias limitations and inaccuracies, the silences, the long periods between writing, for instance, with Tacitus and Suetonius, or the fact that historians today have very limited sources to rely on, or the fact that Suetonius doesn't cite his sources. He tells us that he had access to all of the documents in the libraries, but did he? Uh, the fact that when we read about Mark Antony and Cleopatra, they are the victims of a sustained campaign against the East. Uh, so that if we read uh, accounts by Plutarch, by Cassius Dio, if we look at the poetry of the Aeneid and the poetry of Horace, we have to remember that they were pro-Augustan sources and we should treat them with some scepticism. We've spoken a lot, haven't we, about the self-celebratory agenda of the res gestae, that the genre of the res gestae is elogium, and elogium is about celebrating your own achievements. We could criticize a lot of historians for taking the res gestae as truth, when of course it's propaganda and it's filled with omissions, isn't it, an illusion. And as I say here, the great chronological distance and invisible sources of Suetonius. Okay, so if we're looking to answer this particular essay question about Augustus's rule, as I said earlier, the danger is the title is so broad that you will just write down loads of facts. So what I recommend that you do is to define the parameters of your answer. And you could actually say, this essay will explore the military achievements you could say have one thing on one side saying look at the amazing thing that Augustus achieved in particular this essay will look at his remarkable building program and his military achievements okay but it will also see some of the defects of his of his rule and the go-to topic to criticize Augustus I feel is the succession that is the fatal flaw in the whole Principate, isn't it, okay? Don't forget that what makes a great ruler is highly subjective. And that's why in different times, different people will redefine the idea of a great ruler. I'm gonna show you in a moment Ronald Syme, who was writing in 1939. So I don't need to tell you why he would not like a propaganda leader who seems to, you know, cast himself and use the resources of the state as propaganda. What do the historians say? Inside the booklet that I've created for you, the revision booklet, you'll notice that I have interspersed it with little ideas from different historians. So, Wallace, uh, Wallace Hadrill, very famous historian of the Civil War, he says, the Romans needed to be saved. So he's got a balanced account. He's saying, look, the civil wars were destroying Rome. So they were saved. The Pax Romana was successful. But Romans lost a lot of power. We could argue a lot about that. Because I don't think we'd argue that the populares, the populace, lost a lot of power. I think we'd be saying that arguably the aristocrats lost a lot of power. A.H.M. Jones says Augustus' power depended on the legions. So it was actually patestas and not autoritas. So all of those constitutional settlements actually disguise the fact that the real power was military. Mommsen, we know the great German historian, remember, said it was a diarchy. So he's quite favorable to Augustus, isn't he? And he sees a kind of alliance between Senate and Augustus. Lots of other historians would say that Mommsen is reading Bresgestein and believing it, isn't he? In actual fact, it wasn't a diarchy. 
it was very much more of an author authoritarian structure. Tacitus, we've already dealt with. Suetonius sees Augustus as an exemplary reader, a, a leader, doesn't he? And he actually helps to the mythology of his kind of deification in many ways. There are some hints that, um, that Suetonius sees some defects in Augustus, but on the whole, it is a very positive review. However, when Suetonius completes, let's not forget he does the biography of the emperors that follow, he doesn't like Tiberius, he doesn't like Caligula or Nero, and in some cases he sees them as monsters. And Mary Beard uh, says that Augustus was a chameleon, constantly changing. So she talks about the transformation of him, etc. And she actually says it's very hard to pin down who he really was. Ronald Syme here, have a quick look at the screen and you'll see says that in 1939, as I said, that um, Augustus brought enormous benefits, but the work of fraud and bloodshed. Let's not think, we don't need to think too much about who he's thinking about there in Nazi Germany, who also brought many kind of military and uh, financial uh, benefits to Germany, but then there was a great cost to that. Adrian Goldsworthy, who we all know, you've got a copy of his book, he says that he inflicted nothing like the misery of Hitler or Stalin. So you could use those historians to balance each other, couldn't you, in your answer, okay? And I do feel as though comparing um, Augustus to a dictator in 1939 is perhaps an overstatement. Now, the success of Augustus, you couldn't cover all of these in a 40-minute essay, could you? But any of them would be a possible thing to look at. Pax Romana, I would say that has to come at the top. Because the Roman peace is going to exist for another 200 years. This is the most prosperous era of the Roman um, Empire. And what we have to say is, even with terrible emperors, Rome still flourishes. And that's the great irony. So you could say the great success of the Principate is in some ways to kind of proof it against bad leaders. Yeah. Um, there was never going to be such great frontier expansion again. And the securing of the frontiers, with the exception, as we saw in 9 AD of Germany, um, has got to go down as one of the great successes of Rome. Um, we know that so many of those borders were secured. We know that Augustus believed that Rome had reached its limits. And indeed, it almost had, with the exception of Britain and some other territories. Military reform was massively successful. So you could argue that the army remains a danger to Rome in the sense that it has great power, but it is not ever going to degenerate into civil war as we saw with the first triumvirate and then the second triumvirate. Uh, there was enormous military, uh, sorry, administrative reform, which was also successful, uh, to some degree at least, okay. The reform of the Senate that we've looked at in particular could argue that Augustus brought a lot more status to the Senate, as we've seen, okay. The building programs were an undeniable success. We could argue that Augustus' statement, according to Suetonius, that I found a city of brick, and left a city of marble, we could say there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of evidence that these monuments and temples, the Arapacus, and um, the modern architecture of Rome, the forums of Augusta, uh, were, were absolute incredible successes. And we could also, if you wanted to, just talk about the flourishing of literary culture as well. You've got Livy, the historian. You've got um, Aeneas. Aeneas, you've got Ovid, you've got Horace. In fact, the Augustan age has become synonymous with good literature and the greatest literature that Rome's ever going to have. Other people may argue that that literature is a little bit propaganda-inspired, but um, I think on the whole, the works that we look at today, many of them come from the Augustan era. What of the failures? Well, we can always use our friend Tacitus that there was the death of the Republic. 
We could talk about the fact that it became a world of propaganda. As I said earlier, you might even attack the literature and say, well, the Aeneid is a magnificent work of literature, but it kind of is flawed by the fact that it could also be seen as a kind of species of propaganda, even if it is very beautiful and skillful propaganda. Autocratic government. Again, Tacitus would be our go-to person, backed up by the modern critic Ronald Syme. We could say that the independence of the Senate was lost, that the idea of the separation of powers had gone, that this paved the way for the psychotic leaders like Caligula and Nero. And um, we could obviously lay that at the door of the succession problems and the fact that clearly Augustus wanted to have a kind of monarchy, didn't he? Even if it was a cloaked form of monarchy that didn't reveal itself in kingly titles and overt and explicit powers. Nevertheless, we could say there's an equivalency with monarchy if you so wanted to argue. Going back to the succession, two things. The legalities of the institutions that Augustus developed were maintained for decades. But the political reality of autocracy became increasingly obvious in various ways within 30 years of his death. So we could say whilst Augustus was in power, these things were not so explicit. 30 years later, it was obvious that there wasn't meaningful opposition. And whilst the absence of meaningful opposition in Augustus's life may not have had such harmful consequences, it would manifest later. We could also say that Augustus's handling of the succession issue had ravaged his family. This is what Garrett Fagan says, and open up factional fault lines at court. So the interesting thing, of course, is that Augustus likes to cast himself as the savior of Rome, who fought a faction and united Rome uh, as he says, with universal consent that he ruled, etc. Garrett Fagan is saying, well, actually, the succession created a new kind of factionalism, an infighting, as people jostled to become the next emperor. And that in itself, that legacy, is uh, a kind of disaster, isn't it? And in many ways, that really goes against so many of Augustus's achievements in his lifetime. You might want to, if you, want, if you like, quote Suetonius on Caligula, Little Boots, as he was called. He's the uh, emperor that follows Tiberius, and he opens his biography on Caligula with these words. So much for Caligula as emperor, we must now tell of his career as a monster. That's pretty dramatic, isn't it? So, there's no reason why we wouldn't go back and say that monster ultimately is Augustus's monster. Even if he didn't intend it, his constitutional legacy led to this, led to this kind of corruption and the inability of the Senate to replace emperors. Because let's not forget, Caligula killed, Nero killed. Why? because there was no constitutional way of replacing the leader. Now, there's an excellent essay, I'm not going to go into it now, that you could have a look at here. I put a QR code that leads to it on an evaluation of Augustus's rule. I strongly um, recommend that you have a look at it. And what we're going to do after this is we're going to create a little bit of an essay plan to our essay here. And I've told you why this essay is so valuable. Augustus was a great ruler of Rome. Explain how far you agree with this statement. That kind of generic question will cover many of the possible essay titles that you'll get in the option of question two or three. So we'll look at creating a plan and that will be of enormous value. So just to finish off, when we have a 25 marker, it is absolutely key one, that we answer the question with counter-argument, so that we acknowledge both sides. Even if one side is much weaker, we acknowledge what that side would be, that counter-argument, 
we weave it into our argument, and in the conclusion, we show why it is deficient and why one point of view is stronger than the other. In doing this, we carefully evidence it. And in this course, it is absolutely key that we use the source material. If we have some choice quotes, we put them in there. If we don't, then we paraphrase so that that conclusion ends with a genuine answer of the question. Thanks for listening.